this is the chance to get interactive. So there's going to be drinks after this. Don't worry, drinks coming in. If you got, if you ask questions, if you ask questions to the panel, there will be prizes, and these are these are serious prizes. Within there, there's a solid gold bar worth about. I don't know if there is actually, but um, anyway. So we're just going to we're going to round things off with a, a chance to get a bit more interactive. Um, so first of all, what I'd like you've all got mics, or you should have. I'll just give you guys. Um, I mean, Michael, you've already spoken. Uh, has everybody already spoken? No, you haven't spoken. Already. No. I didn't think you were speaking. I was. I haven't paid attention. So we've already spoken to Michael and Alison. So if we could, if the other two uh, panelists could introduce themselves very briefly and talk about your experience very briefly in the Chinese okay, market. Yes. Hello. So my name is Summer Young, and I'm working at Outfit Seven. And uh, I was actually relocated to Beijing for three years because you know we were setting up. Our business in China, and now I'm back in the UK. Yeah. Uh, so I'm Oscar. I'm the last minute call in. Uh, I used to be global lead for uh, Games Fashion One Power back in the day of Java Games. Uh, I also worked for Papaya Mobile in Beijing for a while, uh, but I'm better known for standing on stage at Steel Media events, talking about everything to do with the games industry that never you never dared to ask. Fantastic. Okay. Cool. All right. Uh, we've got a question for you that we, we do. We had a last minute change, but these things happen. We can roll with it, so it's fine. You can tell us all about you. No, it's fine. Um, so I, I've just got a few kind of set questions, and I'll open it up for, for, for discussion. I'm on, aren't I? I'm on. You can hear me? I'm very quiet, otherwise you, would, you wouldn't catch me. So I want to start with, with, with Michael with Metegrel aside. So you obviously had a, 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 a good presentation earlier, and I don't want to kind of go over too much ground, but... What would you say is, is the, the core strategy for, for you for acquiring uh, for ch a core, core strategy for acquiring Chinese users? Um, I think there are two key factors, and the first one is uh, creative. The second one is channel. The for creative, uh, you need to. There are two things that is important. Just as Stella uh, just said, talking about the first one is about localization. And the other one is playable for localization. Uh, you need to optimize your creative, uh, including images, videos, and uh, all kinds of creative to use a kind of uh, Chinese style uh, factor, such as uh, Chinese music, Chinese background, and the follow the trend in Chinese market. And also uh, do that in your video creative. And also, you need to try some playable ads. Some, somebody may think that uh, making a playable ads is very expensive. Yeah, yeah, maybe it's much more expensive than a video. But actually, it's not. Because uh, for playable ads, it is easier and cheaper, uh, cheaper to do the A-B test. You can easily to change some factor and change the color, change the style in playable ads to figure out the most proper uh, playable ads for yourself. That is creative. And for channel, you need to know exactly the top media in Chinese area and also the and network. What is the advantage and disadvantage of this? Just what I said. This is yeah. two key factor. And you need to combine these two key factor together and from your requirement, and you will get the best answer from that. There's quite a lot there, then. So basically, uh, yeah. talk to me integral. Uh, no, it's good. Um, so I'm, I'm going to come to, to, to uh, Outfit 7, because you haven't had a chance to speak uh, yet. So, so when you released your first title in China, what, what do you feel were the best, biggest kind of obstacles you were kind of facing? Obviously, talking time titles, massive internationally. Um, my son loves them. That's very exciting. But, but what was the, the first big obstacle for coming to China? Um, I would say uh, understanding and communication. So I'm not just referring to the language barrier, but also the cultural differences, the different legal systems, and just understanding the market, actually. Yeah. So we officially launched our first app on 360 in China back in 2014. As you know, there are many third-party app stores in China, and it could be very challenging to launch the apps. And back then, you know, the Chinese app market was actually even more fragmented than it is now. Right. But we found that actually the app store themselves were really cooperative. So they wanted to work with us and we wanted to work with them. Yeah. So, well, other mobile gaming companies were sort of using publishers to distribute their games in China. We built direct relationships with app stores. Okay. You see, um, 
China is one of the most important market for us. So it was our priority to build a more in-depth understanding of the market. And our strategy was to distribute on the top app stores one by one. And once we successfully launched the first app, we quickly launched on many other app stores, such as you know, Baidu, Tencent, Xiaomi, and more. But you know, the ranking uh, back then is very different from it is now because the market changed very quickly. Yeah. So over the years, you know, we have gained uh, a lot of knowledge, like really in-depth knowledge of the market. But despite uh, of the uh, despite the success we have achieved, there were a lot of mis misunderstandings along the way as well. Okay. So just give you a small example. Sure. Well, we. I really appreciated that we were given a lot of opportunities to have our games promoted on the app stores. We were often given very short notice to deliver the promotional materials. You probably know this, yeah. And, you know, so back then we were not used to it. And then gradually we sort of built up a more efficient uh, workflow. Yeah. And now we have the capacity to react very quickly. But obviously, back then, it was quite difficult. So are you working with, uh, I'm going off piste already, are you working with, how many of the Android app stores or the app stores are you working with? Because obviously, there's like hundreds, right? And not all of them are, 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 are big. They're all different. Yeah. So how, do you work with everybody, or is it you work with like a select few that are your kind of chosen partners? Well, back then, you know, as I said, we, we have to launch one by one. Yeah. So we call sort of like starting the top ranking, you know, so we all cover the top one. At the time, it was like, you know, uh, 360, Tencent, Xiaomi, yeah. and more. But now, you know, the ranking has changed, especially in the recent years. You know, the, we the call handset operators now the are mobile quite hardcore powerful, alliance, yeah, yeah. like they will, uh, will put, uh, uh, you know, uh, Huawei and so on. So yeah. they become really big. And, you know, but for us, we had the, the situation that, you know, we, uh, we were acquired by a Chinese group. Yeah. And then, you know, they were working as a publisher. So we not only distributing on the main stores, yeah. but also distributing on what we call the long tail okay. stores as well. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to go to Michael at the end related to this because it's kind of like, because you, you talked a little bit when you gave your advice earlier about the Android market is too complicated. So do you stand by that? That, that obviously, you know, uh, out for seven huge install base already, maybe of a, a different scale to certain other publishers. Do you think for most Western companies, the Android market is just, in China, is too complicated? Or, or how would you, you know, how, what's, it, what's, it, what's it look like at the moment? Yeah, in, in China, we don't have, uh, we don't have uh, the market. Well, we don't have Google, right? And we do not have Google uh, app market. We have many channels, and also we have many mobile game manufacturers that control the the main channel and also some top media. Yeah. For user acquisition, I think uh, mo 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 most of the user acquisition uh, generate from the top top channels. Yeah, and but you can get a little money from the advertising you know, because you you on, you can only use the SDK provided by the channel, uh, unless uh, except the the package. You upload it on your uh, website, on your own website. Yeah. You can use any SDK. But if you use one channel, such as you use Xiaomi Market, you can only use Xiaomi SDK to uh, to do the app monetization. Right. Yeah, the CPM is low. It's just like I said, it's one fifth, maybe one uh, one fifth, one sixth of that in iOS. Yeah. So there's a lot of SDKs. Everybody wants to use their own yeah. system. It's quite complicated. Yeah. Um, Alison, I come come to you. Obviously. From a, from, a, from a publisher perspective, do you think it's, it's kind of essential to work with local partners? That's what everybody says, that you have to work with a local partner. I mean, I know some people are publishing direct through, you know, iOS on their own without doing that, but do you think it's essential to have a local partner? Yeah. Yeah. Sure, answer. Well, that's that one then again. <laughs> Feel free to embellish on that remark. Can I get a chair? Can someone... Yeah. I'm feeling a little bit... I don't like towering over people. Yeah, I don't yeah, it, it, it's just incredibly hard to go to China um, without people who are familiar with the market, like you were saying, um, people who can walk to an office to figure out what's going on with your game that you've submitted for approval, um, things like that. So, you know, it's a, it's a complicated place. I think time zone, just, yeah, and communication alone is 
is really difficult as well. So okay. yeah, it's it's very helpful to have the the local expertise. I'm, I'm going to stick with... Are you going, are you well, going to come I was going to chuck in there. I thought I you, should, you, should, you sat here. You should probably say something. something yeah. um, I'm getting the chair. I also I'm got the impression, um, um, traditionally, that it's been quite difficult up, yeah. for a lot of Western content to transfer into the, the East market, mostly because of audience exception, oh, sorry, acceptance rather than just uh, from the basis of um, uh, kind of... Can you move over? Yeah. I just, I just feel, I, I feel like I'm towering above you a little bit. There seems to be a lot. You know, I'm a man of the people. Because I'm obviously, I'm, I'm looking more at the Western market rather than the Eastern market, but when I look at uh, partners and teams that I've worked with in the past, it's often been a lot easier for Asian companies to come to the West, particularly with certain themes of, of gameplay, but a lot harder, particularly around the sophistication of depth of gameplay. And I'm wondering whether maybe this is why the hyper-casual market is so interesting now, because we're having to focus on simplicity. Is that making it transfer better to, for you? Yeah, you definitely. I mean, it definitely transfers better because it's a, such a broad appeal. Um, and, yeah, in terms of taking your games over there, the, uh, you know, hyper-casual game, again, you, you've only put a little bit of development into them, right? Yeah. And so then dealing with all of this um, stuff on top to get your game over there is pretty daunting. And, and then... Um, you know, the, the west to east movement also, I think, for more mid-core and hardcore games, then you're really, you're competing against local developers yeah. making games that are uh, well, I was gonna, I was gonna experts say that. in that. I was going to ask, is, is there any, because obviously there's, there's, you know, the Chinese games market is pretty huge. There's a lot of companies. Every time I go to China Joy, I'll discover a new company with like 20,000 staff that I've never heard <laughs> of the year before. So... It, it, are the, what are there advantages for kind of Western companies in c coming to China? Do we have any native advantages? Is it kind of is there anything, especially in the hyper casual space that you know obviously comes like Voodoo doing very well, kind of Quali and, and say, is, there, is there anything that? Um, yeah, I think we shout we, out we do find kind of uh, as, from our perspective, looking for Western games that can go over there. We do find a lot of games being made that are creative that are fun that really have that that spice that they need with hyper casual that can then be easily moved over within the local market we also um, have business development happening there as well and we just don't find the same type of, of development happening because they've been so core and mid folk mid core focused yeah and there's been a lot of like three kingdoms rp i mean if you want an rpg that's some i, was, I saw an interesting survey uh, uh, presentation really actually in helsinki and they were saying about how like 60 something percent of the market is all RPGs, and they just so if you've got an RPG, probably probably a quite competitive market to come to China. You're well, well, well don't knock Three Kingdoms. I mean, we, I think Gareth I'm not knocking it, I'm just well, saying no, no, that's been Gareth a focus. Edwards, Gareth, that um, um, Total War uh, Three Kingdoms has apparently been They've their, made biggest their biggest success. success. So, yeah, you know, yeah. that, you know uh, that, that shows that there is there's compelling demand. I mean, the thing for me that I think the Western market brings, and again, forgive me if, if I'm wrong, but I think we have a certain sense of creativity and kind of finesse, and I think particularly with you know, teams like Graham and you mentioned Kuali and Co., they've perfected this, I think it, more than just that it's a, a simple game, they've perfected the hypothesis-based design process. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, that's something we've kind of really worked out. You work out what is the core movement, action, interaction in, in a mechanic, and test that. Mm -hmm. And test that openly, fast, and, and find what works. Yeah. And I think that process applied to artistic creativity is something we've, I think we've done particularly well in the, in the West. Is that, is that fair? Because you, you're talking, it's fine, you take over. Nice. Um, okay, so I, I've got a few more questions I'll have to come back, but this is an opportunity to earn prizes. Ooh. Ooh. Nice. I've, I've just about held them. So has anyone got a question for, 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 for uh, Integral or Joypack or Outfit7 or Oscar or me? Where do I get my shirts from? I can, I can tell you that. Has anybody got a question they didn't get a chance to answer? There's a question there. Can we get my mic? Can someone help me? Do we have any spare mics? Thank you very much. Awesome. Oh, and the gift. Give, don't give him the gift because that's the question. I mean, it could be like... Okay, uh, thank you so much for uh, the gift and a really interesting talk. I really like that you do a really like, data-driven, like, oh, here are numbers. So I'm wondering, uh, so you say like hyper-casual is a reaction towards like all the more hardcore games. What do you see coming after hyper-casual? Will we see a hyper-hyper-casual? <laughs> or uh, are we going more towards ordinary or more core games? I mean, what's happening? Good question. Oh, good question. No, I was going to ask what the next trend. Yeah, go, yeah. go for it. Um, 
What we're seeing happen in the West with hypercasual could very likely happen in China as well, which is uh, more engagement mechanics um, and yeah. A, this, yeah, a little more deepness to them. Uh, we've definitely seen that coming about for uh, for games as well. So it's it's a little bit circular. Then I don't think we're going to keep going down the line in any way, but who knows. Okay. Uh, just want to add to that because um, one of the things that we're seeing is a mistake to make is to try and turn a hyper casual game into a casual game. Mm. That can completely backfire. Uh, but I think some of the things that we were learning back in my Unity days, we were doing some experiments with creating that kind of hypothesis based test around the context loop of a game. Uh, and that's a different way of looking at it. So the, the use of kind of asynchronous multiplayer, the use of kind of uh, the golf clash style tournament systems that can be applied where a hyper-casual game has smart, soft variables like time and score, they can be really powerful. In fact, some of the kind of quality voodoo type games do have this really good mo mo moment in play where you see, you've done this great thing, but you're third amongst your friends. There's an immediate simplicity to that that's very powerful. And so I think we'll see more of that. Okay. Anybody else I think to add on that? No, it's fine. Oh, there's another question. Or was, was that you just raising your hand? There we go. He's, he's seen the prize now. He's, he's excited. So it's good. Uh, no, this is a question uh, on the first presentation. You referenced an acronym of, of which I was not familiar, OCPC or something? Yeah. EC, well, I'm sorry, can you tell me what that is and what it means in China? Okay. In, in Chinese? No, oh, what no, is no, no. Uh, China, that's going to make it more complicated. Don't do that. <laughs> okay. Oh, go for it. Yeah. Oh, also, if you say I give an example, uh, you 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 are advertiser and you pay for advertising may, maybe per click, at, at one dollar per click, yeah. and if the traffic is very good for you, the platform will maybe upper the price or to, for two dollars a click. Maybe the traffic is not super uh, proper for you. Maybe they are. Uh, lower the price, maybe uh, 50 cent, or just like that. It's not uh, fixed. It's kind of uh, fixed uh, price. So it's a dynamic price. Yeah, dynamic price for per one click. Most of the uh, most of the biggest platform in Chinese market, they are doing that, adapting the OCPS uh, OCPC strategy. Yeah. And how do they determine the effectiveness? Then? Are, what, are they looking at some other metrics like? They just looking at basically your they have their uh, they have their own uh, AI algorithm. It's a kind of a model, and they can calculate how much you need to pay for that click. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. As a, oh, I know you've got a question. <laughs> oh, it's a question over here. You can then it was oh, it's no. question over there. You, you you've been in already. You will get a chance. Don't worry. I'm not against you. There's a lady in the corner there. She's. Hello. Hello. Um, competitor data in China, are you looking at it? Because obviously Google's not in China and you've got so many different stores. Um, are you looking at it and how, where? How do you look at competitor data? Are you looking at all the different stores' performance and how are you comparing that? Yes. Oh. Thank you. Yes, no. <laughs> I'm not sure what you mean by competitor. Like. That's the performance of the different app stores. Yes. Yeah. Are we evaluating the Android stores in terms of our performance of our games? Or yeah, is benchmarking against competitors and... Maybe you can take that one if you know. In. Good time. You've been good game. <laughs> 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 Do you want it? Are we, are, I mean, basically the question was, are, we, are, are you evaluating all the stores? Are you kind of comparing... I guess you are. Your channels of... of is there a lot of data available to compare the stores? Oh, we would, actually. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Definitely. Yeah. And is your question about whether there's that data is available somewhere, or is yeah. your question, is like an App Annie type thing, is what you're thinking? Yeah, like App Annie, but in China. <laughs> it's a, okay. it's a China App Annie. <laughs> well, in, App Annie is from China, obviously, but still. In, in reality, you know, like App Annie in China doesn't really exist. You, you know what I mean? And I think in a way, even you might be given certain data, but, you know, that data, like how much that is reliable, is also a question, you know. But you need to sort of say, you know, like 
in a way, like how much revenue do you receive from different stores, right. and you would get certain ideas. Yeah. yeah. So I think the, the answer is probably it's not quite as transparent as you're hoping for. No. Yeah. Uh, maybe. <laughs> any, any particularly bad performing stores you'd like to out <laughs> publicly? Or no? Okay, fine. Um, fair enough. Um, okay. There was a question here. This gentleman stood up at the back. There's plenty of seats. Oh, 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 all right. Okay. It's a big question. Okay. <laughs> hey, how are you? Hello. So uh, my name is Omri. I have a question about, uh, you said earlier, Ellison said something about, you know, you, you don't mind bombarding the users with a lot of ads, right? So what is your take on the ads quality? Are, they con are you concerned about it? Or maybe they, so they, any other of the panel members can answer that? And okay. also when it, when it comes to the user's privacy, uh, how important it is in China? Um. They don't have the same privacy uh, laws and regulations that are happening over here in terms of GDPR and all of that, uh, if that's what you're asking. Um, around the, the quality of the ads being shown, it, it works similarly in that we work with the ad partners to like whitelist and blacklist so we can uh, determine what's being shown uh, in, our, in our game and we can kind of control the quality, if you will, based on that. So basically, you are dependent on the SDKs that you're working with and the networks, right? Right. Okay. okay. And is it working for you? Uh, I don't have any stories that where it's not, yeah. But there's always the case that, as a designer, you can decide where you're going to put those moments of ad. And I think, you know, working out the, particularly for hyper-casual, because they're so simple, if you've got the right level of kind of um, unfinished business between each play, then your placement in terms of the relief part of the player experience is critical to making sure that you optimise the ad. But you don't have the same kind of friction that you would have in a, in a deep, rich game because people just get frustrated and leave in those. But with hyper-casual, you wait for the next thing, you wait for the next thing. Yeah. So it doesn't have the same kind of um, lack of tolerance. Okay. Oh, John. John's got a question. Hey, hey. this will be good. This will be good. Well, time's a party, Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> he, he, is, he doesn't need a gift. He doesn't need a gift. It's fine. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask the panel, um, what's the biggest mis misconception of the Chinese market that you regularly hear? For me, it's that they're different, actually. That like, I get it with maybe more core genres, that you need to be aware of cultural norms um, and themes. But you know, for me, gameplay is very universal, and everybody plays games for the same type of an experience. And so the, the audience is widely different is something that I hear a lot about, and um, I don't think that's necessarily the case for gameplay. I think people have... Uh, yeah, core reasons that for for why they're doing that. Interesting. I think I, I, that's exactly what I wanted to say. But I, th I think quite often I hear, "Oh, my game will never work in China for that very reason." I mean, and then you, particularly around the Western versus Eastern ta uh, type of content, uh, one of the reasons I was saying the thing earlier is that although I think it's harder for Western games to come to China, my impression is that it's not to do with the content; it's to do with the business processes. Mm. Yeah. Right, I've got a couple more questions. Anybody else have a... Okay, we've got plenty of questions still. Arthur over there, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of going first name terms now at this point, so... Thanks, Chris. Uh, Michael mentioned earlier about using two tracking solutions for, uh, for running campaigns in China. So my question was about uh, primarily why is that so, and uh, why, why do we need even double trackers where one is global and one is uh, local? Do they run different attribution models, and uh, do, they, uh, do they have different metrics which some networks collect, like you said? And also, which data uh, does the network rely on in order to make the attribution? Thanks. Okay. Uh, as I just mentioned, the reason for you to use two tracking tools is that the, you, 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 first you need to use a global one, adjust the engine, and then if you want to enter in Chinese market for some, spe, uh, for some Chinese channel, they do not know the exactly the, the detailed number in that channel. So you can not figure out the, 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 the real, what, what is happening in that, that channel. And Chinese uh, local 
uh, tracking tools, they know everything about uh, China, the So you're China saying basically the global, channels, the global tools just aren't very effective in certain Chinese channels, basically? Uh, yes. But the, but the actual data they're kind of collecting is the same type of data? The same, right? same, uh, same, same dynamic uh, metrics or same algorithm. It's nearly the same, yeah, about the data, the report, it's nearly the same. Okay, cool, good question. But, d but does that mean necessarily that, that they actually uh, make a decision whether this network deserves to have the install claim to itself or, or not? If that d data differs, how do they uh, settle this conflict? No, the, the, the total data is similar, but they do not know the, the, uh, the some of the channel, the detailed data in some of the channel, the total data is, is similar. Okay, thanks. It sounds like a bigger conversation you have to have outside. Yeah, we'll talk about it. But it's a good one. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, here we go. The gentleman in the hat. Thomas. Thomas, um, thank you. Hi. Sorry. I probably do know that. I'm sorry. Hi there. Thomas from Flying Sheep Studios. Um, we heard a lot about the Android and iOS stores tonight. Um, I'd like to ask you, I'd love to hear your opinion about WeChat as a gaming platform opposed to the native stores. What your opinion is on that? Uh, well, we use WeChat. So, uh, but WeChat, because WeChat is part of Tencent, basically, you know, and things may have changed now. But basically, if you cooperate with Tencent, normally you can only do exclusivity. So that means like you can't actually distribute on other channels. I mean, it could be beneficial to distributing on WeChat, but you have to evaluate. You know, for you, what do you want? Do you want really to give your games a exclusivity for a particular channel, or do you, you know, maybe it's better for wider distribution? So basically, I'd have to choose between WeChat and all the other stores, uh, which are yeah. competition. So you know, it depends. It may works for you, may not. So I think it's better that you sort of, you know, investigating a bit more and maybe talking to people from Tencent, you know, from other app stores and see w what would be the best op uh, opportunity for you. Is that sort of exclusive to, uh, exclusivity? Struggle that word. Is that a common thing, or is that more of a ten cent thing? I mean, ten cent obviously a massive, massive company. Do, do most app stores demand some sort no, of? No, no. Well, because you say um, ten cent have a, a app store we call my app. Yeah. But WeChat is is quite WeChat, different. Yeah. WeChat is like one, you know, it's a message. But it is the it's messenger, part, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's like a particular channel, yeah. so and it's I've quite got different. Ten off at night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Do so we have any final questions before I... Any more? You, you sure? I, I cut you off it. I feel bad now. You've made me feel... I, you can have a, ask a question. I just want to... Go on then. You can go a question. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, uh, my name is Luna. I forgot to say that before. I work for Appenny. Okay, I, sure. I'm proud of that because Apania has been mentioned so many times tonight. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So first of all, um, I want to just uh, note one point uh, that we we don't have like a downloads and revenue for Chinese stores, but we uh, we do have like usage uh, data for Android. Okay, so uh, maybe. Um, because this market is so massive and complex, maybe the uh, I'm not so sure about the um, you know the um, the accuracy. But uh, if you look at the trends, I think it do reflect the facts. Okay, so that's that's for one point. Uh, so uh, I've heard um, so much information tonight. That I really feel like I learned a lot for uh, this Chinese uh, for Chinese market. Um, one question I would like to focus on is. Um, um, for uh, how how do you see the trend in terms of uh, uh, ad monetization uh, in for hyper casual? Because um, we can see for some in the you know uh, Chinese trend or like in the Western environment, we see like hyper casual they showing other hyper casual apps, right? It, it seems like ads have been circling in this environment. And uh, what is the situation right now in China, and which uh, channels they work with if one, they want to do ad monetization? Thank you. It's a lot of question there. That's it. Uh, just one question. It's fine. It's a good, good long question, right? It's good. Uh, firstly, uh, mo uh, honestly speaking, uh, most of the advert, uh, ad advertisement in maybe hyper cash game or hyper cash game, yeah. But uh, here, uh, right now, there are some big company like ByteDance and Tencent. They're competing right now, and they 
pay a lot of money in this area. They don't earn money. Yeah. Yeah. So we earn money from them. <laughs> Yay! Uh, yeah. And <laughs> and uh, of course, some casual helper game can chase the get can uh, get the chance to earn money from the the two two of the biggest company game company in China. Yeah. And also, there are some hardcore games uh, showing in uh, hyper cash game, but but little for uh, for TikTok uh, TikTok audience network. The you uh, the most of the uh, most of the uh, advertisers show uh, shown in their platform or hyper cash game, but for Tencent meet meet core games. Takes a large percentage of the the, sh the impression, yeah. And for Baidu, they bring some uh, search advertisers into the hyper cash game, yeah. So the money is from them. Okay. okay. Simple. Okay, I think we're going to wrap this up. So I have one last question, and then we're going to to wrap. It's not. I was going to ask a question. What is it? Go on. <laughs> is it is it quick? Is it, it complicated? Is exceptionally quick. Uh, so there's been some discussion of advertising density. As, uh, is there any kind of observation on advertising duration? I notice that there's a lot of ad, uh, ads with timers that are appearing in Western, in Western games. Is, is the audience yeah. less likely to engage in the Eastern market with longer wait timers? No, interesting question. So we're talking about the length of adverts shown. So we're talking about the number of adverts, but also is there, a, is there a, I guess, a happy time limit for ads or I can talk a little bit about what the experiments we did in unity ads back in the day and we found that 20 seconds was a sweet spot uh, but what we found is that a lot of the creative that were already being created was 30 seconds and so it ended up being longer by by habit yeah uh, and there was uh, actually I think a false expectation amongst people who were creating that creative that longer was better uh, but a lot of the optimization is about more about the format than it is about the length but I would, I would still argue that 20 seconds is a much better format than 30. Do you have any, any, any thoughts on length of ads, or is it not really an issue? No? I just don't have any insight. Don't have any insight, okay. So final, final thing, we'll wrap up. Um, final, one piece of advice for, for companies that are looking at hyper-casual games, looking at coming to the, to the Chinese market, what's the one most important thing to bear in mind? Anybody? <laughs> You've just given a presentation. Pick one of them. Me first? Yeah, you first. Yeah, it's very easy. Cooperation with our company. There we go. <laughs> Boom. That's Drop the mic. <laughs> That's why I get some big bucks. That's a good yeah. argument. Come on, let's make money together. Woo! <laughs> woo, 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 woo. <laughs> you like that? Alison, can you follow that? <laughs> For me, it's around that the don't use blocks and balls in your games. Uh, put some more character into them. Uh, just a little bit of, um, of some, yeah, something fun okay. to engage players in it. Cool. Well, I can't actually give advice on hyper casual in particular. Yeah, but, but uh, casual. But I just want to say, you know, for a company who just starting out in China, um, because you say, I think there are a lot of companies who think Chinese market is too complex and they sort of just give up without really taking any action. Or, you know, I also seen companies who sort of rush into setting up offices in China. Yeah. And they also fail quickly because they don't actually understand the market enough. Yeah. So my advice would be a really build a solid foundation of the local knowledge first. Yeah. And, you know, seek advice from the companies who already strong, uh, have strong presence in China and be pragmatic, flexible and agile. Cool. Long one. Short. Short. Sorry. It, very no, short. Yours is fine. It's just him. He just I, talks I, a lot. <laughs> Keep it simple, but leave them wanting to play more. So focus on the game. But at the end of the day, it comes back to choose the right partner. Fantastic. OK, can I round of applause, please? <laughs> you guys have been absolutely awesome. Thank you so much for your intelligent questions, for your patience. Uh, we'll have lots more alcohol. and maybe some more food out there. We are going to attempt to show some football in here for anybody who was interested in that. There'll be, but the bar's open outside if you don't care. Big round of applause for my panel and thank you to Mid-Tech for our sponsors. Dude.